in French subtitles and sharing that tomorrow. Okay, so just to let everybody know. So for those um, of you that we will be uh, sharing the video tomorrow with French subtitles. So we're going to get started shortly and uh, just letting quite a few folks in. Let them in. Let's have a party. So again, welcome everyone. We're going to get started shortly. Um, we're just waiting for a few more people. Again, we have different folks in the room with us. We have Brad, who will be doing the presentation today from the Rick Hansen Foundation. We have a mixture of different tenant departments, as well as our client, PSPC. So anybody, after this meeting, if you, you have more questions, please just let us know. We'll arrange a follow-up meeting. Um, this is part two. Um, we did an introductory session a few months ago in the spring to really introduce, you know, um, accessibility and what, you know, ac you know, accessibility for all could look like within a building. And um, we had a lot of questions and we said, a lot of our attendees said, I want practical things I can do. We call it, Brad calls it with a bucket of paint. So, um, not, you know, um, but that's what we want to be able to do is look at some of the practical. So we're not, you know, doing a whole redesign of the building. We're looking for these very practical things. So we still have quite a few people coming in, Brad. So we're just sure. going to wait for a few more minutes. The more the merrier. Yeah, there's quite a few um, external people coming in. Cool. So anybody has any questions, just jump right in, interrupt us. We are recording the session um, and we'll be providing a copy of the presentation with French subtitles as well. And this is really to help us with our accessibility journey, whatever journey you're on, wherever you're at, this is a general presentation that um, we support PSBC and our tenants with. And this is part two. When I send the copy of the presentation um, to, tomorrow, I will include a copy of part one as well. And we've added French subtitles to that as well. And Brad, unfortunately, no parler français, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a few people still coming in. Great. Hello, we're just gonna get started shortly quite a few people coming in, so I'm just going to admit them. Sure. And any person in BGIS, once I start the, the presentation, um, if you can just admit people, that's fine, because I might have a hard time doing both. Okay, so again, this is part two of our outreach with the Rick Hansen Foundation. And um, if it, we will be sending a copy of the presentation with French subtitles. Part one was done in the spring. I will include a copy of that, uh, that video as well. Um, there wasn't any presentation material, but Brad gave us a great um, overview of you know, what accessibility for all could look like. So we're here to answer your questions. If we can't finish um, answering your questions within the hour, please don't hesitate to let me know. We can book a follow-up meeting. Again, we've already done so with, for example, DFO who's on the call. Um, we have a follow-up meeting with them. And it's really to provide as much guidance as we can, not only with um, the Rick Hansen Foundation, but how to access BGIS um, and how we could help you and how we could link that to the Rick Hansen Foundation, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and even if, if somebody had questions about, you know, training, um, we can provide, um, Brad's team has given me all of the information on uh, training that Rick Hansen Foundation gives, so I have that available. Um, for the internal folks for BGIS, we are sending out a corporate email, but that, I have a ton of information that Brad has given me over the last while to share. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brad. And maybe you can start with an introduction and talk about yourself. Oh my God, talking about myself is what I do best. Brad McCall, Vice President of Access and Inclusion for the Rick Hansen Foundation. 
Uh, for any of you that can't access the monitor, I'm a 69 year old white male. And when I took this job, I had a full head of red hair and now it's white and thinning quickly. <laughs> I'm wearing a blue jacket, black shirt, coming to you from my home office in beautiful downtown Pender Harbor on the west coast of British Columbia. Um, I've been with the foundation for seven years now, and I was brought in to develop the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Program, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But uh, I had the great pleasure a couple of months back now of doing uh, an overview of just what exactly access means and the, the, the environment that you're working in and how to apply, really in practical terms, the seven principles of universal design. And uh, I'm hoping that, that, that there's going to be a link to that so other people can check it out. But just by way of a quick refresher, what was important that came out of that session was that understanding that the built environment is the foundation which all the other pillars of accessibility is based on. Right. So, you know, whether it's employment or uh, emergency evacuation or uh, web access or communications access, they're all reliant on an accessible built environment because without that base in uh, access, then they can't thrive. So our focus at the foundation switched to the uh, built environment about seven years ago, and we focused on that because we just understand that after a, a report from the Conference Board of Canada that revealed 57% of our community was unemployed, we tried to find the reason, and the reason is quite simple. The commercial and retail space is not accessible, so therefore it's not a, a place you can be employed, which is really vexing because uh, the, the most incredible employment equity program in the world won't work if I can't get in the building as a wheelchair user. You know, accessible destinations become less important when there's no accessible, sorry, accessible transportation becomes yeah. less important when there's no accessible destination. So our focus shifted yeah. to the built environment. And so the other thing that we, that's really critical to understand is, is what we call meaningful access. You can change that slide, please. The, the, uh, the meaningful access, what is meaningful access? Well, as, a, as opposed to code minimum access. Well, meaningful access is the whole experience. From the moment you arrive at the building, whether you arrive in your car, on a bus, or just walking down the street, meaningful access is the whole experience. It's not just whether you have an accessible washer or an accessible elevator. Can I come in? Can I, you know, function? Can I talk to the receptionist? Can I, you know, move to the building? Could I work there? So all these things are taken under account. Is what the RHFAC Accessibility Certification Program looks at the whole the whole issue, as opposed to code access, which is really code minimal, which you have to do, and no more than that. The problem with code minimum access strategies is they're really wheelchair centric. It takes three things to create meaningful access. The first one you have to know who you're designing for. What we were just talking about a little bit earlier. Who are people with disabilities really? It's not just about wheelchair users. If your focus is on wheelchair users, if your focus is the code minimum access strategy, then what you're looking after is about 30% of the population of people with disabilities. And what's important there is if you're only serving 30% of that community, you're missing 70%. You're also missing 70% of the return on investment that's available there when you have an accessible environment. So it, it, this is a win-win deal. If you build it, they will come, and if they come, they will make it profitable. We often say that a barrier to a person with a disability is a barrier to making a profit. The second thing you do, you have to move accessibility up to design food chain, up to management food chain. You have to understand that in, in the real world, access is not a, a, not a design decision at all. Architects will build whatever you tell them to build. Access is a management decision. Management decides what they're going to put their resources into. And if you're going to put your resources into code minimum access, then you're going to constantly be playing from behind. You're going to be constantly retrofitting. The only way to deal with this properly is to get ahead of it. The third element of creating meaningful access is to help professionalize the delivery of accessible design. In other words, use accredited professionals. Accredited access professionals or RHFAC professionals in our case, you take the training with, with the Rick Hansen Foundation, 
you have the opportunity of once you've passed the course, you have the opportunity of taking an external exam administered by the CSA group. And if you pass that exam, you're considered an RHFAC professional. So you've got, you're accredited. You, you, you're someone who actually knows the issues, knows the built environment, knows how to apply the seven principles of universal design in a really practical way. And that was a long way of saying, <laughs> that's why we're here today. We're here to do nuts and bolts. We're going to talk about real some, uh, was, uh, we talked earlier about a, a can of paint. Some of this is literally a can of paint. But a lot of what I'm going to show you today are the real simple things, the low hanging fruit we sometimes call. So it's that idea of what can we do that largely in the built environment that exists. You know, it, when you're doing a retrofit, it's much harder than when you're doing a brand new building. And with a brand new building, it's lines on a piece of paper, so you can do all kinds of things. So practical examples. Let's do a slide change. Let's, let's just take the take the journey. So when we arrive at you know any given site, some of you have parking, some of you don't. But where you control your parking, one of the things you want to really look for, yeah, yeah, we all know the dimensions of it. The second thing is an ex a safe pedestrian pathway back to the sidewalk. Often you'll find a, 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 a what they call handicap parking spots, but we prefer to call them as parking for people with disabilities. But it, you have those designated spots, but they're on little islands off to themselves. And yeah, they're the right size and you can get out of your car. But if you have to cross the path of travel of, of, of cars, You've got a real problem because as a as a wheelchair user, you're noticeably short. And you roll along, and some of these big SUVs, they can't see you when you're behind them. Sometimes you'll see a wheelchair with a, a, an orange flag on it up high. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get people to see them when they're going through parking lot. But if you don't have a connecting pathway, a marked hash, hash marks, or, or, or better yet, direct connection to the sidewalk, if you don't have that, you're, you're creating a real liability problem because if you put a parking spot off to the side, or I have to cross the traffic path of traffic, then you told me to park there. You told me this is the safest place. And if I have to roll across traffic to get there, or you know, where's the nearest curb ramp? However, I get out of the parking lot. People forget all the time about getting out of the parking lot. So if you look at this photograph, you can see clearly marked pedestrian route to the curb ramp. Parking's on the right side of the road. But it's really important connecting. That connecting route is critically important. Another critically important thing is if you're doing electric vehicle charging stations, uh, there are thousands of them being put in every day and none of them are accessible. What, what are we thinking here? You think that people with disabilities will never drive an electric car? And I have to say, Brad, we yeah. put the first one in. It's going live the beginning of December at oh, 111 Sussex. Oh, you're my hero. You're the first so one. We, we have developed, if anybody's looking for those standards, we have developed the standards for the um, accessible EBCS, and we have a paper on it. If anybody's interested, you can reach out. But we did, we did one um, uh, of them just to, and we'll start monitoring it. Now those stations are just being in the midst of testing, they go live the beginning of December. So just to let everyone know, and that's at 111 Sussex in Ottawa. That's terrific. Wow, you, you may be the first one in Canada. <laughs> I, I know, I, I'm on the Accessible Standards Canada board uh, developing standards for federal properties, and it's been a battle to get them even to do it properly. So I, I, I'm so impressed. But I see it every day, and again, it's not hard. It's not hard to do. It's not a can of paint, but it's not hard to do. Um, so next slide, is, let's look at the endpoints. Oh, I think we missed one. Or I got the wrong order here. Do you want me to jump ahead? Uh, no, let's do let's do the bra bra. I don't know how I got here, but anyway, um, it, it's obvious from the photograph what we're talking about here. You know, y y ensuring safe pathways through public transit. Now I know you don't control public transit. But still, that's a key factor in getting into and out of the building. So it's something you need to be aware of. And when you do a Rick Hansen accessibility certification, it's one of the considerations we take. But on the passenger drop-off, again, a dedicated curb ramp. 
I can't tell you how many times we've been in drop offs where you're dropped off. And, you, and, and if you look at the way that car is positioned in that photograph, the purpose is to get out in the hash marked areas. The car isn't going into that space, the person is. And so you have to have that space beside the car. If you park right beside the curb, now you've got a, you know, about a six inch lift from the, from the vehicle up to your wheelchair. That's really hard. That's Rick Hansen territory. That's not something Brad McCannell can do. Next slide, please. Exterior of it. But here, here's something that's that gets missed all the time. You know, especially in modern buildings, our own offices at the Rick Hansen Foundation are at the BCIT Aerospace Campus. And the front door is invisible. Great door, a, a, a gray, uh, all the fittings around the door are gray. The, gray. the door itself is glass. It fits into the wall. There's no markings on it whatsoever. You need to identify the door. You need to identify you know, the, the pathway to the door is critically important. If you look at that photo on the bottom right, you see that little edge there? That edge protection is just critical. It does two things. One, it, it provides a roll stop for wheel, wheel mobility. Oh, I can't even say it. It's so exciting. Wheel mobility devices. You can't roll off the edge. And you can see in that case, if you rolled off the edge, it would be serious problems. But it also provides what we call a tapping rail. <clears throat> Excuse me. For people using uh, canes, it gives their cane, when they do the sweep, it gives their cane something to hit. And when it hits, it guides them. So you can have an irregular curve because they can navigate that curve by knowing where their cane is. You'll notice there's one on either side. The other thing you notice about that photograph, there's a bench there, terrific bench seating. The more seating you can provide, yeah. the better, especially as people get older and travel as far. But there's, the other thing about that bench is there's a space beside it, open space. What's that for? Well, of course, it's for wheelchair users. I have a place to park. Simple things, simple additions. In this case, they're concrete curbs. You can do anything. You can do you can do a tapping rail, literally a two by four along the edge. Depends on the application. You want to fit it to the design. You want to make it look like it belongs. But simple solutions. The other thing is identifying the actual entrance. Make the entrance a different color, or put a you know a signage on it, or or, or or paint the frame so it's a contrasting color. Make the entrance stand out. Make the entrance identifiable. Look for opportunities to create shelter. For people in wheelchairs, uh, many of us, uh, I'm a quadriplegic. I've been a quadriplegic for 43 years. One of my biggest enemies is the sun. Because when I get hot, I got a problem. As a quadriplegic, I, I don't I don't sweat like you know like able-bodied people do, so I can't dissipate the heat. For me to get out of the sun is really important. So shelter is not just for rain, and it's not just because we're from Vancouver we rain all the time. It's because sun is all, as big a problem as uh, the rain is, for that matter. So all kinds of things you can do. Uh, you know the the door, if it's uh, a motion detector that opens, is great. I know that under certain circumstances that doesn't work or it just creates yeah. too much wear and tear on the equipment. But where it's possible to use a motion detector instead of a conventional switch, this old button, that's really helpful for the whole community. It's really helpful for people in strollers. It's really helpful for people carrying boxes. Simple things you can do. Next slide, please. This goes again to what I was talking about earlier. That, that, that there you see a sliding glass door with this motion control. That's the holy grail for us. That's the perfect scenario. If you can get a sliding door motion control, you can't always do that. So if you can't do that, well, even if you can do that, that color contrasting on the frames, make it stand out from the adjacent walls. And if you're using glass doors, please, please, please get some glazing on them at eye level. They have to be identifiable. People are going to walk into them. There's going to be all kinds of issues around that. Just make that glass wall identifiable. Use a logo. You know, it doesn't have to be a you know a big yellow sticker. 
It can be the logo of the company. It can be anything that just delineates that there is something here and there's a glass wall. Don't walk into it. The other thing that we were talking about motion controls, sometimes you can't do that or it's just not practical. You'll notice on the bottom left of those photographs, it's kind of hard to see, but buttons have changed. They're not just little buttons on the wall anymore. They're about a meter and a half high. And that's so people, some people, you know, reaching for a button is, is daunting for a lot of people. People carrying boxes can just kick that switch. People in wheelchairs can just ram the bottom section of that switch. Or you can reach the top section of that switch. It's all about creating options. It's all, you know, the key to universal design is creating choice. And so this outdoor can be operated a number of ways, and that's a huge advantage if you can't do a motion control. Really simple solution, really inexpensive. Can be added after the fact very easily. What's next? Halls. This is a big one. People forget about hall. This is where the can of paint on, on thing comes from. One of the first things you lose as you get older is depth perception. Really difficult. It creates anxiety, it creates falling hazards, real and imagined. White ceiling, white floor, light colored walls. There is no depth perception. How do you fix that? Well, what if you paint the baseboards a contrasting color? An amazing thing happens. It's called parallax. It's that railroad effect. And now the hallway is delineated. And now there's depth perception. And now the anxiety is reduced. The falling hazard real and imagined is reduced. You got to paint the uh, baseboards some color anyway. No cost item. Just remember to do it in a high contrast. Mark, you know, it delineates the floor from the walls and, and it creates that depth. The other thing is, look, you'll notice in that photograph, big long hong, hong, big long handrail okay. on big long corridors. Makes a big, big difference for a lot of people to have that support. It can be used as wayfinding. It's all kinds of things. So in long corridors, get a handrail in there, a graspable handrail, same mm -hmm. as on stairs. The other thing that's in this photograph on the top right, a little hard to see, but one of those convex mirrors where you have a 90 degree corner. In new design, we try to eliminate the corners completely. Just chop them off at about a 45 degree angle. And what it does is it, it, it all but eliminates collision hazards on that 90 degree corner. Next time you're walking down your hall, look at those 90 degree corners. You'll see they're all banged up. Something's hit all of them. So if you take that quarter off, it, it creates the sight line around the corner. But if you can't do that, it's a retrofit. You throw a little mirror up in the opposite corner where you can see around the corner when you're walking. It's a game changer for people using wheel mobility devices, especially people on canes and crutches. They, you know, a wheelchair user can survive a collision, but a person on a cane or a crutch can't. They'll be on the floor. The other big advantage it is if you happen to have people using sign language, walking along, talking to each other, the Western Institute for the Deaf, which I'm sorry, just renamed to Wavefront in, on the West Coast here, they just built a new building and one of, that's one of the first things they put in because they found that they were having a lot of collision hazards on 90 degree corners, but people walking, talking, watching, watching the hands, right? Not watching where they're going. It's the same with ramps. We always thought that ramps were for wheelchair users or people using wheel mobility devices. Out of that university on a program right now, are reducing, taking out all the steps that they possibly can. They had a number of steps, one and two steps, just through their concourses and stuff. They were finding people; their falling rate was just enormous because people were walking and talking. By replacing that with ramps, it suddenly <clears> became <throat> ramps became a really functional thing for people with hearing loss. Who knew? So lots of little things you can do there: so mirrors, handrails. Color contrast. What's the next one? I know it's gone crazy. I'm going to go off the slides here. The lobby. Ah, yes, yes. OK, so lobbies are a really key part of the facility. It's, 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 the, it's your face. It's the, the first thing people see. So make sure it's easy to easily to it, easily identified. My mouth doesn't work today. 
Make sure it's easily identifiable. Make sure there's lots of signings indicating where the washrooms are, where the elevators are. Lots of good directional signage. Tactile direction indicators. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But tactile pathways are really useful, really important for everyone, not just people with vision loss. Everybody, everybody can use this kind of guidance system, this kind of wayfinding. Having a washroom adjacent to the lobby of reception, I know that's that's a big retrofit, but it's a big, big thing. Seating. Seating, seating, seating. We're going to pound this drum more and more as people get older and older. Traveling distances is hard. Having a place to sit down and, and, the, and the components of that. You know, good good seating has to have a backrest, has to have armrests or arms on either side. Some people need to push to get off. If you got a, in a perfect world, you have chairs with arms and chairs without arms, because some people would rather transfer out of their chair into another, or their wheelchair into another chair. But they can't do that if there's arms on them. Other people like to push off the chair, especially older adults and seniors. If you if you have any kind of balance issues, if you're you know strength in your legs, and the furniture itself, make sure there's kick space on any furniture you buy. Kick space is that space under your seat. So can you get your heels under your under your uh, seating position? So when you stand up, you've got leverage. If your feet are ninety degrees, like on a typical couch in the living room. It takes great balance. It takes great leg strength. And most people you'll find will push off the armrest to stand up. If it has kick space, if it has that space underneath, it should be about a third of the depth of the seat where you can get your heels under you before you stand up. It makes it 100% easier. The other thing you want to think about in terms of reception desks um, are uh, amplified handset. Or hearing loops for people, you know, basically a system that picks up a person's hearing aid as they come in the room. And now the receptionist and the person can have a meaningful discussion without a lot of screwing around. Reception and service counters, I see you got to uh, jump ahead of me there a little bit. That's OK, but we're talking about the same thing. The first thing I want you to notice about this is that the lowered section, and in this particular counter, we wouldn't use this photo again. I'm or I would meant to replace this photo actually, because I think that should be much larger. But the important point here is that the main service area is accessible. Not off to the side, not to the corner. The main service area, the, 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 the sight lines to the reception is the, the point where you walk in the building. Having high counters on either side for all you bipeds out there, that's okay. But having the main service area at a universal height which is 34 inches or 865 millimeters. Knee space underneath. Sight lines to the receptionist. Really easy, really simple. Other things, you know, assisted listening devices. We talked about the hearing loops. Very inexpensive installation, something around 1500 bucks and it changes the whole world for people using hearing aid. And the other thing that, that it's available now, it's, called, it's a text to text system. You can imagine as a person who is deaf how fabulous that texting is for communications for them. So having a text-to-text -text system at a reception where the receptionist can actually just immediately access their, their text numbers and communicate that way, it's very helpful. Again, little simple things you can add on. Having a hearing loop in a meeting room is really important. You know, law, hearing loss is the number one disability by a mile, well, we're not exactly sure because people don't report having hearing loss. You've all heard it. I could hear fine if you'd stop mumbling, those guys. Well, if you got, uh, getting a hearing loop in a meeting room, you, when you look at, we talk about the aging population all the time, don't forget that means your staff is aging too. None of them will reveal hearing loss to you, or to your employer, no, they'll never admit it out loud. They don't at home. Why would they do it at the office? But at the office, it could have all kinds of reper uh, repercussions because suddenly if you reveal that you have a hearing loss, will that affect your career? Will that affect how you move forward? And so people just don't want to talk about that. So be proactive. 
simple things. The hearing loop in the meeting room, hearing loop, wherever there's congregating people. It's automatic, you don't have to do a thing. When it's working, it's working. Uh, what's the next one? Should be waiting areas. There it is. My notes have caught up. Again, it's all about choice. Having a variety of seating. If you look in the bottom right, you'll see the first set all have arms. The second set have no arms. You can see really clearly this kind of seating has an enormous kick space. You can get your feet right under you. Look for furniture with rounded corners. It, it seems trivial, but 90 degree corners, sharp corners on tables, especially with older adults and seniors in the office. And you have older adults and seniors now just by the fact that the population is aging. But when you hit a corner, your skin, you know, get older, your skin gets thinner and you bruise easier. If there's any children around, those corners are just deadly. So just look for corners that are rounded off before you buy them or after the fact. There's nice little caps you can buy right off Amazon. Keep the seating in, in a color, color contrasting, either the floor contrasting or the seating itself. Arrange lots of clear space. Again, people with wheel mobility devices need a place to park. Really simple, really easy add-ons. Next one. Workstations. Well, you know, everybody knows about variable height desks. What a boom they've been. They've been great for everyone, but they're particularly good for people using wheeled mobility devices. Remember, we need lots of clear maneuvering space and task lighting. Get a lamp on the desk that we can turn on and off ourselves. Really important. But the other thing is having outlets up on the desk. You've seen some desks have them mounted right on top. Even if it's a power bar screwed to the bottom of the desk, get them up off the floor. Trying to plug things in on the floor for anybody is hard because of the insane place that pl plugs are placed. The history of this is quite interesting, actually. Do you any idea where why plugs are where they are? Well, it goes back to the when in electricity was first brought in. And in those days, there weren't electricians, there were carpenters. And carpenters installed the electrical boxes. And they were installing them everywhere, and they were kind of up and down. And they all got together one day and said, oh, we got to make this work better. So let's do it all the same way. And somebody put up their hand and said, well, I don't want to have to measure every time. OK, so from this day on, we're going to take a framing hammer. We're going to put it on the floor, and the box will be at the top of the framing hammer. And that's how it was done. From that point on, all outlets were put in roughly 10 inches or something like that. There's no rhyme or reason to that. If you, we call it the six inch rule. If you lift all the outlets in the building up six inches, and you move all the room controls, lighting, security, all, if you move those down six inches, the six inch rule, then it becomes accessible. And it doesn't look weird. You don't wanna, you know, you can put an AC outlet up, you know, at 40 inches, so it's really easy to plug in, but it looks like hell. You can't have that. By failing that, get it up on the desk. Huge difference. Just even to plug in your computer as you're going, as you're recharging or whatever. Really important little things. Task lighting, outlets on the desk, and clear space. There are people, who, whenever you clear out a space, people have a real tendency to fill it. Let's put a garbage can there, or let's you know put some storage there. Resist the temptation. I know storage is a problem in every office. But resist the temptation. Next one. Ah, kitchen, staff kitchen we're talking about here, not home kitchens. Although a lot of the same rules apply. A couple of drawings there just to give you some reference. But there, if you're looking for that in detail, that's actually just CSA right there. That's CSA B652, I believe. In terms of the space and the dimensions. But again. Make sure the approach itself is accessible. You know, a barrier-free path of travel to the kitchen, and that there's clear space inside. Knock those corners off. Microwaves are a big problem, even in homes. 
but in any kitchen, there's a tendency to put the microwave above under the counters, above the stove usually. But mounting in a microwave up high is, I think the last stat I heard is 4% of the burn cases at VGH were because of microwaves mounted up high. Because what happens? Well, we all do this. We, we all put stuff in the microwave and we always overheat it. Because you never can guess right. And then you open it up and you're reaching above your thing and you're pulling it out of the microwave and you're right at eye line and it's hot. And you drop it. And where does it go? Right on your chest, right on your face. So not only is it inaccessible to at least 30% of the people with disabilities, but it's a danger, really incredible danger. It's, it's inaccessible to people using canes and crutches. It's inaccessible for anybody with balance issues, anybody who's short, anybody who's little. Get it out of there. Put it on the counter where it belongs. Just put it on the counter. Make sure there's space on, on to the side of it. All microwaves open from the left side or hinged on the left side. It's actually, it's actually one manufacturer that gives you the choice, but it, it's about a $3,500 microwave. So I don't think that's going to happen. But leave space on that side so that when you do pull it out and it is hot, it's crazy. The other thing you can do is mount it a little lower and put a cutting board underneath it. So that when you can open the microwave, you can pull out a cutting board and you have a place to drop something when it's too hot. Have a place to drop it when it's too hot. It's going to happen. Again, this is a no cost solution. All kinds of things. The other thing in the kitchen, if, if you're doing a new uh, construction, is try to get an AC outlet on the front face of the counter rather than the back on the backsplash where it normally lives. You don't want to have to reach across the counter to plug something in. Pretty simple. What's next on our list? I think it's acoustics. This is a big, broad topic. Again, looking for things that we can do that are, are fast and working. Now, the, the classic way to dampen down sound is carpet. But you got to remember that if you put down carpet, then you're creating a conflict because people using wheel mobility devices have a hard time on, on carpet. And yet, people who are hard of hearing, they want carpet on everything because it dampens down the sound. So how do you square that circle? Well, you know, it depends on traffic. I would bet you that for every wheelchair user that's using your building, there's a thousand people who are hard of hearing. So universal design says help the most people the best way. Okay, so let's put in carpet. But let's keep in mind, yeah. we have to wheel things on this. So first off, eliminate the under underpass. Step one, make it so the carpet isn't gishy. The step two, use carpet tiles so they can be replaced easier because you're going to get wear in specific spots, especially if wheelchair users are using it quite a bit. Third thing is use uh, closed loop carpet tiles and directly glue them right to the floor. So there's minimal resistance to, to wheel mobility devices, but they have that characteristic of damping the cell. Other, you know, or if that, you know, for any reason whatsoever, you did, carpet's not practical, not desired. Lots of other things you can do. You know, create that those sound baffles. You see things on the ceiling all the time. There's some examples in this photograph right here, bottom right. Well, they're breaking up the sound. That's the purpose of that. On the bottom, uh, bottom, uh, well, both those pictures also making the ceiling absorb sound so it doesn't bounce around. Double glazed windows. You know, it, we ran into problems with heritage buildings because they wouldn't let us replace single pane, three mil single pane glass, which was the norm in the 1930s. They wouldn't let us replace that with double, uh, double glazed windows. And for us, it's not a heating issue. For us, it's not. A, it, it, it's simply to dampen the noise from the outside coming in, making it a better workplace. And interference from other background noises. You know, it, it depends on the work environment and what you can do. Uh, I've worked in really noisy environments where they've generated a, use a pink noise generator. Pink noise, I said it right, as opposed to white noise or any other noises. By generating that 
it basically it's like uh, an opposite phase. And so they can filter out the HVAC systems or they can filter out all kinds of things. So there's ways of addressing all these acoustics. And it's, it's sim sometimes it's simple as hanging some baffles, putting in a carpet. But there may be an opportunity to use a pink noise generator, even a white noise generator, depending on, on the application. It, it depends you know, whether it's an office or you know, a factory type setting. But address it and understand that hearing loss is the largest disability group by a mile. Maybe people with mental health issues or neuro, neurodiverse community could challenge those numbers. But again, we don't have accurate numbers on either one of those groups. We just know there's a lot of them. So if you don't address it now, it's going to bite you later. Next one, I think is washroom, universal washrooms. And again, <clears throat> this is one of those, depending on your jurisdiction, um, a lot of jurisdictions don't require a backrest or a toilet seat lid that serves as a backrest when it's flipped up. For older adults and seniors, for any, you know, any 90 percent of the wheelchair community, we have balance issues. So if you purchase on a, on a toilet with no backrest, it's scary and dangerous. So get a backrest. Cheap, easy. Nobody falls, much better. Look at this particular washroom though. See, having an emergency call button, for, for people with disabilities, if we're gonna fall, this is it. The most common place to fall is, is in a bathroom transfer, even in your home. So what we like to see is emergency call buttons, so that if you have a problem, you can get some help. And whether that rings at a reception desk or a security desk, or even it's a flashing light in the hall that says, hey, I'm in trouble in here. Really that, important. That call button looks awfully high, doesn't it? That's what Can I was just look? coming to. This, this is, uh, I, I believe this is Pearson uh, Airport in Toronto. It's crazy high because if you if you need it, you're probably on the floor. That's kind of where I was going. I don't know if I was on the floor, if I'd be able to reach that or not. Yeah, and sometimes you see what they, they'll hang a, a string off it. And put a little ring on the bottom so the idea is you pull it but i don't know if you've ever looked at those but i think i'd rather lay on the floor than pull that string they're, they're so slimy and glowy and gross and they're usually damp and you're thinking what the heck is that and i don't want to pull this but yeah they should be 18 inches above the floor if you want to take it a step further you know in high traffic areas like uh like an airport at yvr for example we're now installing an intercom system rather than a button if you've got, you know, if, you know, if you're in a situation where it can be monitored, so the person could say, hey, are you okay? Or did you hit this by accident? Simple intercom. One way, you know, you have to be careful with that. It can only work if it's activated from the user. It can't be activated by the people getting the call for all these reasons. But yeah, that, so this is, it's insanity. I, I, even, even the position, if you're going to leave it high, why is it way over there? If you're on the toilet, you can't use that. It's just, it's just, I just don't understand. The other thing about this, if you look at the toilet paper dispenser, imagine yourself sitting there, minding your own business. Your day is done. You feel much better now. Time to clean up. Lean forward, bend all the way over, and see if you can reach that. All the while thinking about, I can't reach the emergency buttons. I better not do that. Why isn't that over? It should be in line with the front of the toilet. And I know CSA says this is OK. Just another example of CSA being wrong. CSA being years behind the times. Not understanding who's actually using these things. Even the, the toilet seat covers that are up above, up high, that's not accessible. This is supposed to be a universal room. What are they thinking? So just putting a sign on it says it's the um, the uh, universal washroom and putting a grab bar in this. That's not enough. Again, there's no cost to this. There is now, I guess, as a retrofit. But geez, at least move the toilet paper over. For God's sakes, have a heart. <laughs> Don't do this to me. Open roll toilet dispenser, by the way, it's the right dispenser. Those other ones that are they're, they're big round ones, usually dark colored black. And they have two rolls in them, two enormous rolls in them. 
they are not accessible. People can't imagine trying to use that with no dexterity or limited dexterity. Limited reach, limited balance. So this is a universal washroom with nothing but trouble. So it's not universal at all, is it? What's the next one? Wayfinding, I think. And, uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about wayfinding and signage. It, it's, it's the best way to uh, support the UEI neurodiverse community. Jack it out. Uh, it's the best way to support older adults and seniors. It's the best way to support everybody. Nobody wants to go the wrong way, but if you're in a wheelchair or a cane or a crutch, you don't want to head the wrong way and have to come all the way back. And, and blade signage is a good example of that. So finds yeah. that sticks out from the wall. So if your washroom's at the end of a hall, I don't have to get to the all the way in the hall and find out it's the wrong washroom. Overhead signs, blade signage. It's really important. The other thing about wayfinding is there's lots you can do with it. It's not just signs. You know, and, and, and the clumsy example is Walmart, where you have the big McDonald's feet to take you to McDonald's. But you can do that really beautifully. You can, you, you know, another clumsy, well, not clumsy, but uh, uh, obvious. If you go on a BC ferry, when you park, there's on one level, there's a whale, on another level, there's a crab, and on another level, there's a sea urchin or whatever to try to get you to lock into that. And that's how I get back to where I belong. So wayfinding can be anything. It can be color, it can be scent, it can be texture. We had one building where the entrance was completely, everything was gray, 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 gray on gray. Couldn't find a way to make it accessible for people who are blind or vision loss. So what do we do? Well, we planted lavender. There's lavender at the front door. So now, as a person with vision loss, or anybody for that matter, turn left at the lavender and you're there. Now, you got to be a little careful there because of uh, 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 environmental sensitivities. You got to be a little bit careful, especially inside, but you can use color, you can use sound. When you go to the airport, at what, Vancouver International Airport, in the baggage hall, there's a beautiful waterfall. And if you don't need that as a directional cue, then it's a beautiful waterfall. But if you get off the airplane and, and ask somebody which direction to go, they send you to the waterfall. So people with vision loss, people who are blind, navigate using that sound. So there's all kinds of things. At YVR, if you're standing on tile or terrazzo, you're connected to an exit. If you're standing on carpet, you're connected to a gate. And if you're standing on anything else, you're in retail. That's really valuable information. It's not too... Uh, uh, Difficult for interior design people to follow that. Lots of room to move in there. I'm not saying everything has to be bright yellow. You look at these photographs again, using art to distinguish this wall. This is a memorable wall. A little scary. I, if my service dog saw that totem pole, they'd probably bark at it. But same time, you'll know that thing. And you, you know, the other thing you notice: look at the contrast of the door. The door stands out. The door's got a window in it. Now, that's not going to work for um, people in wheelchairs. That's a fire code issue. They won't allow a window bigger than that. But, but for able-bodied people or temporarily able-bodied people, at least they can see through that door and avoid a collision. It's really important. So there's lots of ways of doing wayfinding. And lots of them are really inexpensive. So look for ways of doing that. Don't rely on signage alone. Next one is exiting, right? There you go. And many of you have heard me on this before. This is one of my pet things. Because the building code works really, really hard at getting people using wheeled mobility devices. It works really hard at getting us in the building and doesn't care at all about getting us out. There's no requirement for emergency egress to be accessible. So it's that whole thing about uh, next time you're standing in front of an elevator and you see that little plaque that says, in case of fire, take stairs. Where's the little plaque that tells me what to do? There's no little plaque. And the building code, at least in this part of the world, I mean, in BC, no longer requires areas of refuge because they have sprinklers. And we would argue there's lots and lots of reasons to evacuate a building besides fire. 
So I think you need an area of refuge. You, you, you can use stairwells, but an area of refuge is actually more than that. An area of refuge is, is fire rated walls. It, it's, it's separate air supply. It's, it's an AC outlet. In case you're there in a power chair, the equipment failing. It's a communication device. Something as simple as a phone or an intercom. So you can have the comfort of knowing people that you're, that people know that you're actually there. It's it's visual fire alarms. It's we call these signs the green running man. You notice the red exit sign is a thing of the past. Red was never a good color to use in a low light. But you can see these green ones work well. You'll see the the uh, on the wall there. That's a fire extinguisher, I believe, and it's mounted at accessible height. You know, it may not. It's hard to tell in the photograph, but that. Fire alarm pole, that red fire alarm pole, is at 1200 millimeters from the finished floor. We used to put them at 1550 all the time. And we did that because, hey, you know, we don't want kids to pull them and cause problems. Problem is short people, little people, all kinds of those can't possibly access that. So get them down to the lowest height that is practical, which is 1200 millimeters above the finished floor. Again, window, that window is the one that's permitted by fire code. I'm not sure why they won't let us put a bigger window in there, but they won't. So that's another discussion for another day. Exit door is a contrasting color. Don't make them all the same color. It's back to that can of paint. Have to be able to find the door. And remember this in this in an emergency situation, this could be all smoke. The final thing is the evacuation chair. This is, if you don't have any way of getting people out of a multi-story building, then you've got a serious problem on your hands. You've got a serious liability problem on your hands. Evacuation chairs are available all over the place. Uh, in, in, uh, I, I personally like the EvacuTrack, but all it is is a device that you can either hook onto a wheelchair or you can transfer into it and sit in it. It allows a a, a 90 pound person to take a 300 pound person safely down a set of stairs. It's really just a device that hooks on and at least goes down the stairs. It's got a clutch on it, it's got all kinds of resistance. If you're in a situation where you need to come up instead of down, we have that they make them in power form. So you can literally turn on a motor and it'll get you up the stairs in the same way. Have some way out for people with wheeled mobility devices. Some way out. Brad, we're, just, we're just about at the 10, 10 more minutes left. So oh, I'm talking. Okay, I'm almost finished. Let me just quickly go evacuation, evacuation signage. I'm talking too much again. It's just my it's my calling card. The uh, go to the next slide, and that's just the evacuation instructions. The only thing I wanted to make point I wanted to make here is they got to be bigger than we're doing right now. They got to be high contrast, and they got to be somewhere you can see them. So they can't be mounted high. Center line height of 1200 millimeters. Oh, my slide says 1100. <gasps> Caught. But large print, high conscious, non reflective surface. Real quick, let me just do the next slide, please. And I wanted, what I wanted to show you here this is the impact of contrast and photoluminescence. So the other thing we can do it on an exit can of paint is paint the nosings and the handrails in photoluminescent paint, glow in the dark paint. That's what happens. That's what you see in, in, a, in the same staircase. And all it is is literally a can of paint on the nosings and on the lines. You go back to the other one for a sec. Can't see it. Used to be I had to paint it green and interior design hated it. Now it's clear. It's a clear paint. Go back, you know, go ahead one more. And you can this this is what happens. This is photoluminescence, but for anybody with using contrast, this is what happens. If it was black against the white surface, the same effect, the same dramatic effect. It's a yeah. paint. Okay, and, and last ones, real quick. I just wanted to talk about tactile pathways. So the straight line tells people using canes and crutches, or no, canes and crutches, using canes. To follow me, follow me, follow me, come to me, come to me. This is what this is the right way to go. And when you get to a decision point, it's truncated domes. Those little bumps you see. So here's an opportunity. You can go to the elevator, you can keep going straight. These we use uh, just 
this is the uh, Canadian Science Museum in Ottawa. A great success. These are, but these work for everyone. They work for absolutely everyone. They're like the McDonald's feet in Walmart. Anyway, that I, I can end that right there, and I'm happy to take questions. I hope there's some questions because uh, we covered a lot of ground here. But my point today was simply to find simple things you can do even after the fact. But the simple things you can do uh, on every application, no matter who's doing what. Sure, we do have questions. Ella, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was totally, completely eye opening for me. Um, I am a property manager for 22 Eddy, which was chosen as part of the um, accessibility hub pilot buildings in Gatineau. Um, I recently had a question from a tenant when it comes to accessibility in elevators. Um, there were certain questions in regards to, um, you know, the the signage buttons. How do you like? How do you essentially? How do you assess? What do you install? Is there such thing as bilingual? Um, uh, tactile signage and I wondered if you might have any input on that we've approached service providers and they are kind of also stumped a little they're not really used to those kinds of questions so they've been looking and I figured why not bring that up here as well uh yeah no, it, it, what we find the elevator man, manufacturers are living somewhere in the 80s so they have something they, they call a handicap package which is offensive just in its name but um they do have that, but it, it's not enough. I, I, I've i been down this path a couple of times. We had to do custom signage to have the bilingual. On the, we just had to. Uh, we didn't see anybody offering that, and so that was site specific. That was the only way to get around that. Um, if if you're if it's new construction and you can get a panel on the side wall instead of the end wall, if it's on the side wall, it's just better for everyone, uh, but mostly for wheelchair users because you don't have to turn around to hit the button. But that gives you an opportunity, usually more real estate, because you've got much more room to do a side panel. I've got some photos of that if you'd like to see it. I don't, I'm not, not handy, but I, I'm happy to send them to you. Yes. But I, the other thing about an elevator, excuse me, a dog here. My, I have a service dog and he haunts me all the time. Um, the other thing about elevators is, is to try if you, wherever you can. And again, it's tougher on a retrofit, but to make the floors a light color. If they're dark colors, bad things happen. Um, in, in the lower mainland of Vancouver, just in the last, I think, 10 years, we've had six people go into an elevator that wasn't there. I know it's not supposed to be able to happen. You're not supposed to be able to open the doors unless the elevator car is actually physically there. But six times we've done it, four times people have died. One time a nurse was pushing a wheelchair and she was talking to somebody else. The door is open, she just went in. So having a light colored floor is a really a great way of really highlighting, hey, guess what? <laughs> it's actually physically there. Again, no cost, low cost, easy cost. And uh, in the elevators themselves, make sure they have a proper handrail. Many of them just have that flat plate. And that's designed to protect the elevator. It's not designed to protect the people. <laughs> having a place to grab on to it, again, older adults and seniors makes a big difference. Makes a big, big difference. But the other big thing, of course, is the, the, a voice, a voice caller saying, you know, first floor, second floor, those kinds of things. They're cheap now. They're bolt on for most elevator systems. They're a plug in add on. Huge difference for everyone. Big difference, massive difference for people with vision loss. And okay, we have another question, uh, Scott Graham. Hi, uh, Scott Graham from the RCMP. Just wondering, uh, I didn't see a copy of this presentation circulated with the invite. Uh, will that be circulated at some point? Absolutely, it will be. We'll share it um, with a copy of the uh, recording, so feel free to share it with your uh, counterparts or anyone you're working with. So I will be sending that tomorrow. Excellent. Thanks very much, Julie. Great presentation. Yeah, it was Brad. Part two was better than part one because uh -oh. all of a sudden we have great examples, and I think the pictures really helped. Well, I had to set you up first, though. You have to understand the whys and the who's and what who it affects and all that and the warm and fuzzy stuff, you know. And and then when now that you see there's there's real tangible easy solutions, low hanging fruit, bucket of paint. But you know the the great tool in all this is our RHFAC accessibility certification program. That's what'll identify all of this stuff for you and gives you a starting point. So at the risk of sounding too commercial, get an RHFAC rating or better yet, take the course. 
If you're an industry professional, yeah. take our course uh, and, and learn these issues. Whether or not you're ever going to rate a building or not, doesn't matter. Take the course. But the other thing is, if you're not an industry professional, but you are interested in these things, our second course, Accessible Spaces 101, is designed to get people up to speed. What is universal design? Why are we trying to do this? Why does it work so well? And, and, and understand that it's, universal design is not about people with disabilities, yeah. it's just better design. And I'll provide a copy of the information because though their course is across Canada for anybody who wants to take that certification, um, whether you're it's part of your job or it's you know you want to assess buildings or I know there's some of our BGIS folks have that certification as well, and <clears throat> so there's 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 just lots of opportunity as you make this. Um, journey with in accessibility and, and Brad has been extremely helpful in helping us define what that could look like. Um, what does it mean? Um, and do we have any other questions before we wrap up? I'll just mention that that course is available online as mm -hmm. well, so you don't necessarily have to attend, but we are in right across the country in post secondary institutions right across the country. Absolutely. This was great. It provided all the examples of what we can do. And I know for a lot of you, you know, you know, you may not have all the money to do redesign um, or retrofit. So these are the options available to you under an operational budget. So that was the intent. Our operations team needed something to help them along with what they could do. Um, so we'll be using this recording as well for our operational technicians, as well as when you're doing a project, think about what you can add to it to make the, the bill, um, uh, it more accessible. So if you're doing electrical receptacles, well, think about where you place it next time. No additional cost. Yeah, and don't let your procurement guy buy things that are gonna create problems for you later. Don't let <laughs> them buy a fridge with a freezer on the top. So I can't reach it. <laughs> buy a two door fridge. Don't let them buy a desk that doesn't isn't variable height. Don't let them let them do that stuff to you. Because when they do it, you're stuck with it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Okay, well, at this point, Brad, I want to say thank you very much for your time. Again, yeah. this is very helpful. Um, we have follow up meetings with uh, uh, folks who have already expressed interest in additional um, meetings and information. We have one with DFO next week. Anybody wants additional information and you didn't have a chance, um, you can uh, connect with myself. I will book with Brad and um, your team, Brad, um, and get those meetings uh, coordinated as well. So um, again, Brad, thank you so much for your time. Every time it's very helpful and um, we really appreciate it. Oh, I love people talking to people who make the difference and that's you guys. And again, thanks to the team who've been putting lots of information in the chat, even around the training and all the different things. I haven't been able to keep up with that. Thanks again, Great. everyone. And thanks I really again. appreciate it. Appreciate Thank you, time, everyone. Guys. Bye.